Chapter 9 of A Water Biography by Robert C. Leslie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 9 Summer Weather on the South Coast The Wings of the Morning We Sail for Plymouth Anchor off the Hull Add some stones there to our ballast The Port Admiral objects through a Coast Guardsman We Apologize last resting place of those stones a long trip up the tamar the navigation of tidal estuaries by strangers easy on a flood tide but risky on the ebb the younger members of my crew and their good conduct the library of the yacht gayness of plymouth after sidmouth we lay in stores and sail for Fowey. Enter that harbor full sail. Rig of the RVW first idea of from the old swan of the Warren. Comfortable corner in Fowey. Exploration of river to lost withiel, etc. We nearly take root at Fowey, but on reflection sail for Falmouth. Pull up the fowl to Truro and go by land to Penzance. The yacht has her bottom scrubbed. We rejoin her from Truro in the dinghy after spending a week at Penzance. Sail again for Plymouth but anchor in the yelm. No supplies there. A change of weather. Our anchor drags, and we leave the yelm about midnight and run into the sound. Weather bound in catwater. An epidemic on board. We sail for Salcom. Anchor there for the night. A beat-out of Salcombe. Thick fog in the channel. The bell on the start. A bricksum smack looms up and asks where he is. A fine afternoon into Dartmouth. On our south coasts, in fine true summer weather, there is a regular land and sea breeze that from the land springing up soon after sunset and lasting until nine or ten the next morning when after an interval of an hour or two of calm about noon the wind comes in from the sea and may be fairly trusted until it dies away toward sunset it was in this kind of weather that, literally taking the wings of the morning, we ran out of the little port of Salcombe, not to remain in the uttermost parts of the sea, but past the Salcombe Mewstone and Bolthead and Tail, across Bigberry Bay, past scenery Mr. Murray, in his handbook of that date describes as exceedingly romantic although almost as unknown as the shores of kamkatchka i don't know whether he has scratched this out yet but i know we had lots of time to admire it because here the wind fell light and with the tide against us we lay almost becalmed until the sea breeze rose and took us on before it closed by that grand outlying home of the sea mew 
the Plymouth Mewstone and pass the breakwater into the western entrance of the sound where we brought up close under the hole. Among other matters, while anchored at Dartmouth, we had carried off in the dinghy nearly two tons of large clean stone as additional ballast, and finding the trim of the RVW would be still improved by a ton or two more, Baron and I innocently went ashore here the day after we arrived and loaded the dinghy to the water's edge with handy-sized stones, and had just done stowing two loads on board, and were taking in a third, when a spruce coast guardsman in white ducks, with a spyglass under his arm, hove in sight, bore down upon us, and pointing to a notice-board some distance off, informed me that these stones belonged to the admiralty and must on no account leave the shore and that he had the port admiral's orders to obtain my name etc though i did not quote it the chorus of marriott's old sea song of port admiral you be damned occurred to me but baron was more happy and profuse in his apologies and having been in the service would be the last person to think of touching her majesty's property we had certainly not seen the notice and the heavy penalties incurred by any person etc painted on it tupman however on our return said it was only what he expected we had already quite a ton of plymouth hole under the cabin floor and having in a weak moment left my card with the polite coast guardsman i was in constant terror during our stay here of being boarded by an officer armed with a search warrant for those sacred stones he did not appear however and they remained on board the r v w for nearly two years or until i became so much attached to them that a memorial cairn or rockwork was built of them in the garden of the first house we lived in at southampton after our escape from the happy vale of the cid i have sculled a heavy thames skiff with three adult passengers and three children on board from oxford to london in three days and once rode my wife in a light boat from ross to chepstow forty miles down the wye in the day but the heaviest day's work i ever undertook was in my dinghy from our anchorage off the hoe up the tamar above cothiel and back we left the yacht about nine a m with a large supply of sandwiches a bottle of milk and some beer not forgetting some water and some scraps for buzz being only eleven and a half feet long by four feet three wide our boat was rather heavy for a single-handed skull of nearly thirty-six miles and whenever our commodore gave leave the lug sail was hoisted not only as auxiliary power but to afford shade from the sun we took of course a good tide with us and happily tide is no respecter of size or form of boat so that we reached cothiel about two p m where the river looked so enchanting that it was impossible to resist exploring it a mile or two further 
where we landed at a little riverside place called i think cherry orchard the navigation even of an unknown broad winding estuary like the tamar is easy enough in a small boat upon a flood tide and long distances may be saved in one by cutting boldly across shoals and banks from point to point because with a flowing tide even taking the ground entails only a short delay for water enough to float again but the return voyage down with the ebb requires more care even in a small boat when like the tamar a river spreads at high water or half ebb over broad shoals of sand or mud which are rapidly left dry in places far from either shore so that as you scull down what looks like midstream the bottom of the river seems to come suddenly to the top and if after scraping over a bank of this sort the boat was stopped upon it with a fast-falling tide i always stepped overboard at once and if the water deepened ahead hauled her over it but if this was not the case she was pulled astern to try back for deeper water in such cases every moment is important in order to avoid being caught aground far from shore with the prospect of remaining there until the next tide on soft mud of course this plan must not be attempted but in these devonshire and cornish estuaries most of the shoals are hard enough to stand upon and lightened by the weight of one person a small boat is more easily piloted into deep water i have gone into these details because i am sure that had i lost time on board my boat trying to shove her ahead or astern with an oar we must inevitably have been left aground to spend half the night on some desolate flat as it was we reached the r v w at eight thirty p m and were not sorry to find the kettle boiling and the cabin table laid for supper or late tea also that no further news had reached baron from the port admiral in so small a boat as our dinghy long excursions like this up the tamar and other rivers with three children might have proved anything but pleasure trips but for the invariable quiet orderly obedience of those children at their age life even on board the r v w was necessarily one of restraint but during the three months we all lived in her i cannot recollect any trouble from them i think the mark tapley character of these youngsters was greatly owing to the fact that we had always taken them with us wherever we went so that the rip van winkle the foam or even the little dinghy was for the time home to them while as nursemaid and private tutor combined baron was invaluable either afloat or during a run ashore with him and the dog buzz then again though far from being luxuriously furnished in other things the r v w had a solidly concentrated library in the shape of all marriott's novels twenty-two volumes of household words nine of the penny magazine and the whole of knight's english encyclopedia so that when confined on board in wet weather there was something to read for all upon most subjects after our long retirement among the wilds of devon and quiet of sidmouth 
the busy gay town of plymouth and its handsome shops had i almost believe more attractions for my wife than even the rocks of bolthead and bigbury bay and we spent many pleasant mornings ashore here marking and adding little refinements to cabin furniture and the day before starting for the old port of fowey we were careful after our salcom experiences to lay in here a good supply of fresh meat butter and vegetables the distance from our anchorage at plymouth to fowey was about twenty-two miles and having secured my usual monsoon we ran out of the sound round ramehead and made the entrance of fowey early in the afternoon the mouth of this harbor is not more than two hundred yards wide but having a leading wind we ran straight for the anchorage among several small vessels under all sail the peculiar rig of the yacht enabling one hand to lower her sails at a minute's notice the jib fore and main halyards being let go by him and the mizzen by the man at the tiller in this way i was able at once to reduce the ship to bare poles while tupman steered and baron stood by to let go the anchor her jib ran on a stay and in moderate weather was as easily taken in as a foresail while all four jib-headed sails could be hoisted by one hand and a youngster this rig required few blocks beyond those on the main and foresheets and there was less than a dozen on board all told the heaviest part of her mainsail in hoisting it was carried by the mast hoops up the inclined plane of her raking mast and the head of it by hanks running upon a wire jack stay set up abaft the mast this simple rig suitable rather for a sea-going houseboat than a yacht was not original but suggested by that of the swan of the warren of exmouth she often brought pleasure parties to sidmouth and during the time they were ashore her owner mr Britton, handled her easily alone for hours or until the return of his man and party in the boat the day after we arrived at fowey we shifted the yacht into a small landlocked inlet just above the town on the west side of the harbour where we lay so near shore that after letting go one anchor we moored ship with a line made fast to an apple tree this cosy little corner had quite a fascination for my wife and here the r v w lay more than a week as quietly as a thames houseboat one comfort of such a berth was that being out of the tide we were undisturbed by changes in it or by other craft bringing up or getting under way near us while even our anchor light which persistently went out at midnight gave no anxiety we explored the fowey river in every direction including four miles up to lost with and from there walked to the grassy wild briar grown ruins of restormal castle for historical account of which see murray in fact we were so much impressed with the beauties and amenities of fowey and its convenience as a boating place that we felt almost as inclined as we had been at salcombe to encamp there permanently and rent or build a damp little waterside hermitage on the shore of its pretty harbor 
There is a risk, however, that living in such a place you become attached to it like a limpet or some fungoid lichen upon its rocks. I therefore sailed at once for Falmouth, where we left the yacht and pulled up the fowl in the dinghy to Truro, Tupman accompanying us to take the boat back while we went on by land to Penzance and the land's end for a week in order to give the men time to lay the RVW ashore to scrub and tar her bottom, which was now very foul. After our week at Penzance, Tupman met us at Truro again, and we rejoined the yacht, now anchored in St. Ma's Road. Our cruise westward ended here, and after a few pulls in the dinghy among the winding creeks of the lovely fowl, we started for Plymouth, or rather the mouth of the Yelm, a narrow inlet to the eastward of the Mewstone. Our voyage, with light airs and calms, was slow, and we were not off the sound until after sunset, when, my wife having read somewhere about the beauties of this little river, we ran in and anchored near the entrance for the night. I have generally found that the finer the natural scenery, the worse the food, and that a point may be reached in this direction where it cannot be got at all. Tupman and the boys were ashore at once in search of milk. He was away over an hour, and said on his return he had climbed the hills above us and walked a mile before finding even a farmhouse, and then he had some difficulty to get a little milk. He had been here before and wished to go farther up the river, but seeing how narrow it was, and what an awkward place it would be to get out of with a westerly wind, I decided to remain where we were. We had not been anchored long when the weather showed signs of a change, and I was roused by our Commodore about 11.30 p.m. with the news that she was sure we were dragging our anchor. I listened a moment, and sure enough came that dull grating message up our cable from the bottom, which once heard cannot be mistaken, and looking out of the cabin doors found a fresh wind had sprung up. I called Baron to give her three or four fathoms more chain, and as I stood watching the landmarks, a large fishing boat ran in close by us from sea, and hailing us, said we were on his mooring. I told him we were on our own anchor, and asked what the weather was like outside. He answered, blowing fresh and dirty, on hearing which I told Baron to call Tupman and tell him I intended getting under way at once, so as to clear out of this corner and get inside the breakwater before the wind, now to the eastward of south, shifting to the westward. This was about midnight, and Tupman turned out rather slow and sleepy, and tried to induce me to wait till daylight. But I had such a horror of being caught to leeward in a trap for some days, with no supplies near, that I told him I meant to start now while we had a leading wind out, and then went below to warn the Commodore that things might be lively on board for an hour or so. And leaving my second boy, who was never seasick, in charge of the cabin and any movables below, I went forward to help the men get under way. It was nearly one a.m. and a dirty-looking morning, 
but there was a moon, and the RVW was not a boat to mind a little sea, and under her snug canvas we had a splendid sail out round the mewstone, and past the shagstone and turkar buoy, were inside the breakwater just as day began to break. The wind was fair, and we ran up the sound and anchored in catwater long enough before sunrise to turn in again for an hour or two before breakfast. We lay here weather-bound for nearly a week, and the day after anchoring the wind blew so hard that the men, even in our plucky little dinghy, were unable to pull across to Plymouth Town, and Tupman confessed that he was glad we left the Yelm when we did, for had we been weather-bound there we might as well have been on a desert island with all the mouths we had to feed. The only anxiety we had during this breeze was from a big lump of a stone sloop lying just to windward of us with no one in charge. But she held on all right. It was here that a slight epidemic first showed itself on board among the younger part of our crew, in the shape of chicken pox, contracted no doubt in the Penzance lodging but it proved of a mild character, and our little girl Kate was the only one who remained a day in bed with it. And directly the weather became settled, we decided upon a change of air, and weighing anchor made a good passage of four hours to Salcombe. It was on leaving this pretty little port the second time that the skipper and crew of the RVW first really felt proud of her sailing qualities. The wind was right into the harbor when, in company with a local sloop, we started for a two-mile beat out of the narrow port. The sloop had the start, and we worked tack and tack astern of her until near the harbor mouth we passed her, and after another board or two saw her give up and run back to her anchorage. Perhaps we might have followed suit had we known what it was like outside, for we had hardly rounded the prowl before the wind fell light and so thick a fog settled down upon us that it was almost impossible to see a length ahead. We were bound round the start, about four miles off, and then on to Dartmouth, and kept our course a little to the southward of the start as well as we could, until we judged ourselves nearly abreast of it, when we edged in for the land again until worn by some corks of a crab pot knew it was not far off and almost immediately afterwards heard the bell on the lighthouse high in the air above us on the port bow the wind now freshened up a little and after standing to the eastward for a while a bricksome trawler loomed up suddenly in the fog just ahead on the other tack and asked as she bore away past us how far they were off the land we answered we had just heard the bell on the start then asking where we were bound and being told said you will find it as clear as a bell a mile or two to the nord we shaped our course accordingly and he proved right for after passing berry head we sailed into dartmouth in bright sunshine end of chapter nine